Hello and welcome to the Joe Cannon Health Podcast. I am Joe Cannon and this is episode number 10. And for the 10th episode in this show, I want to pick a topic that is perennial in the news and that is diets. It seems like there are more diets than you can shake a stick at. Studies show most Americans are on a diet, but which one do you choose? So in this episode, I want to give you some tips on how to spot a diet that may not be so healthy for you. I've got seven things that you should be thinking about and hopefully these things won't happen to you if you do go on a way weight loss program. Now, before we get into the meat of the episode, I want to cover the myth of the week. And the myth is kind of a myth. It's kind of not a myth. It actually has some truth to it. And it is the idea that when you're exercising, your metabolism stays elevated for a period of time after you're done. This elevation of metabolism after exercise stops goes by different names. The old name uh, used to be called the oxygen debt. When I was in school, a new name arose, which is quite still common and popular in the scientific community. It's called EPOC, E-P-O-C, and E-P-O-C stands for Excessive Post-Exercise oxygen consumption, excessive post-exercise oxygen consumption. The newer, cooler name, cooler, sexier name these days that I often hear in the gym is afterburn, afterburn. By whatever name you call it, it simply just refers to the calories that we burn after exercise stops. And studies do tend to show that after you're done exercising, you're burning a few extra calories and your metabolism stays elevated for some period of time after exercise stops. The thought, however, is is that this extra calorie burning will contribute significantly to someone's weight loss efforts. Well, does it? It turns out that this idea of elevation metabolism after exercise has been around a long time. When I first started investigating this, I came across some uh, papers written back around uh, the turn of the, of the century, around 1900 or so. And those researchers did in fact notice that after people performed really difficult activity, their metabolism was higher. How higher? Eh, some reports said maybe between 15, 20, maybe even 25% higher. Some researchers, however, these days look at those reports and say, well, that's really interesting. They didn't make any reference to weight loss back then. Eh, made a lot of sense. There weren't, weren't as many overweight people in the 1900s as they are now because uh, we, back then, were working around uh, the farm, etc., and walking more than we are now. Now we drive, we sit in front of computers all day long, and so weight loss is a bigger issue now than it was 100 or so years ago. So newer research actually has come out um, on this topic, and what I want to do in this segment of the, of the episode is just kind of briefly summarize the results of some of these studies. Now, a study came out in 1990, uh, and it was simply titled The Effective Exercise Intensity and Duration on Post-Exercise Metabolism. This was a fairly small study, as most exercise uh, investigations tend to be. These were nine guys. Uh, they were accustomed to exercise, so they were not they were not novices, and I think that's a that's a good thing. We want generally want to uh, see what happens with people who are used to exercising. What effect of what what effect of this afterburn occurs with them? And essentially, they had these nine guys either uh, walk on a treadmill, jog on a treadmill, or run on a treadmill between 20, 30, and 80 minutes at a time. And they exercised at various intensities ranging from 30 to 50 to 70 percent of their uh, VO2 max. And VO2 max is simply your maximum aerobic ability. So they exercise between 30% of their maximum aerobic ability, 50%, and 70% of their maximum aerobic ability. And their metabolism did go up after exercise is over. But what did this really mean? Well, what I'll just do is just summarize, paraphrase, if you will, uh, the results of this study. The researchers basically said, yeah, the metabolism did go up, up, but the elevation in metabolic rate that they noticed was of little value 
unless the exercise occurred on a regular basis. And we all kind of know that. It's not what you do any one time. It's what you do throughout the course of weeks and months and years that really does tend to add up in a variety of different ways. And the thought is, is this small little increase in metabolism might increase over time and accumulate uh, kind of like, you know, uh, little interest in a bank. It accrues over time and it adds up. That was 1990 and it was an interesting study. What else we got? Well, a few years after that, actually this this century, uh, 2014, we've got another investigation. This one's a little bit more complicated in its title, but it actually says what it, what happened. A high intensity interval exercise induces 24 hour energy expenditure similar to traditional endurance exercise despite reduced time commitment. That's how scientists write. It, essentially, if you look at it, they kind of told you what happened despite all the wordiness in that title. Uh, essentially, they're saying um, that longer exercise, shorter exercise seem to produce similar elevations in metabolic rate. So what, what, what was this study like? Again, we got nine guys. These are young guys in their 20s, probably college students. And they had them ride an exercise bike at either 70% of their maximum heart rate for 50 minutes. Again, moderate, basically in, in moderate, moderate intense exercise. Or um, they did 20 minute high intensity interval training, a HIIT workout, and their heart rate went up to 90% of their maximum heart rate. So they exercised at a, a longer period of time at a, a lower intensity and a higher intensity for a, a shorter period of time. And what did they find? As the, as the title of the study suggests, the elevation in metabolic rate after exercise was basically very similar between the high intense workout and the more moderate intense workout. They seem to burn similar amount of calories. And that's actually good news and bad news, depending on how you look at it. It's good news for the people who say, I can't exercise at a high intensity because of maybe, you know, joint problems and arthritis and stuff like that. I can only do moderate intense exercise. It's bad news for the people who love to do high intensity interval training and subscribe to the fact that HIIT training for a short period of time will raise metabolism even higher and result in more weight loss. This study basically said the elevation of metabolic rate was very similar between both lower intensity activity and higher intensity activity. So what all is the take home message to all this stuff? So I, I would basically say that, you know, afterburn, epoch, oxygen debt, whatever you want to call it, it's a real thing. And our metabolism does go up for a period of time after exercise is over. That's great. It's wonderful, actually. But the research appears to show that the burning of calories after exercise, the amount of calories you burn after exercise is over, does not appear to be as dramatic and make it as dramatic effect on weight loss as what some people might think. So if you're exercising, just realize that your metabolism will stay higher for a period of time. You are going to burn some extra calories over time as you continue to exercise over the course of weeks and months, etc. That extra calories, they are going to build up and help help weight loss efforts if that is your goal. Um, and, and also, they are also going to be reinforced by cutting back a few calories in the food you eat. The exercise and the nutrition do play a role there. They do go hand in hand with weight loss efforts. And I think really that is going to be the take home message. Don't always just put all your eggs in the epoch basket, the excessive post-exercise oxygen consumption basket. It's a thing, but again, we've got to combine it with nutrition to get the biggest results uh, out there. So hopefully that makes everything more and more sense for everybody. Uh, if you have any questions on epoch and afterburn, et cetera, just you know, send me an email at one of my websites, joe-canon.com or supplementclarity.com, and I'll, uh, I'll take a look at your email and see if I can help you out. So let's leave the myth of the week and let's dive into the main topic for this episode. And that is weight loss programs, specifically weight loss programs that you may want to avoid or at least give some thought to before you do them. I've got seven tips here for you, things that um, I think you should be on the lookout for if you're going to choose a weight loss program. And hopefully this will help you sort what's a, maybe a good diet from maybe not, not so good diet for you. And the first tip that I want to give Give you is um, a bad diet would probably be bad if you start to smell like ammonia. Usually when people tell me that they are they're smelling ammonia, it comes through the pores of their skin, that to me is usually a tip off that they're either exercising too intensely 
or they're not eating enough carbohydrates or both. The thing we have to remember when it comes to carbohydrates is one of the things they do is they help protect protein from being broken down for fuel. And when we greatly reduce our carbohydrate intake, this causes the body to start looking for an alternative energy source. And what it'll do is it'll start breaking down amino acids. Amino acids make up proteins. And as a result of this, there's going to be a buildup of ammonia in the body. And sometimes you can smell this on a person. So the technical name for this process is called gluconeogenesis, gluconeogenesis. And that's just smarty pants talk for the formation of glucose from non-sugar substances like an amino acid. Amino acid is not a sugar, but if we have to, we can take these amino acids, we can break them down, rearrange them, and turn them into an energy source that we can use. And in the case of amino acids, ammonia can be produced in the process. And as I said, you can sometimes even smell the ammonia off people. Usually, uh, when people tell me again this happens, they realize that the smell is most prevalent after exercise. That's why I said they're either exercising too intensely or they're not eating enough carbohydrates or both. Since we're talking carbohydrates at this moment, I'm, I'm sure some of you are probably thinking about the most popular low carbohydrate diet right now, and that is called the ketogenic diet. So what does this whole ammonia thing, uh, how does that play a role in maybe the ketogenic diet and muscle loss, for instance? Well, there's not a lot of research on this topic as of now, but there was a study that came out um, and it was three month long and that's what got my attention. I don't see a lot of diet studies lasting that long. This was a three month long investigation of the ketogenic diet and it was actually involved people who were doing CrossFit. CrossFit, as many of you know, is a very intense exercise program. This investigation, again, like most, are fairly, fairly small, only nine people. And if I remember, these were people in their 30s. And they basically had the people either do a keto diet and do CrossFit, or they ate normally and did CrossFit. Again, they did CrossFit, they did the keto diet for three months, they ate normally for three months, did keto diet for three months, etc. And they worked out, again, three days a week, did their CrossFit workouts. And after the three months are up, the researchers did before and after tests on these individuals. And they noted that the people who are doing the keto diet, the ketogenic diet, the thickness of their vastus lateralis muscle, that's a thigh muscle, had decreased by about 8%. So the thigh muscle, one of their thigh muscles appeared to have decreased its circumference, its thickness, if you will, by about 8%. And the, the overall lean mass of their thighs in general appeared to drop by about 1.4%. Again, this is, again, the very first study I've ever seen on keto and exercise. I thought it was very interesting because keto drastically restricts carbohydrate intake and normally exercise will help reduce muscle loss. But apparently in this study, even doing something as intense as CrossFit did not appear to reduce the muscle loss from their thighs. And I, again, I found that very interesting. The researchers do say we need more research to know what's happening. Could there be some fluid shifts in the muscles uh, that occurs because of the alteration of the diet? It's possible. And that's why I normally don't like to put one, you know, all my pennies in just one basket. I personally would like to see three different studies that see if they can find the same thing. Um, they did measure body composition with the DEXA scan, which uh, if you know me, you know I'm usually not a fan of the DEXA scan because it involves radiation, but that's when I that's when we take the DEXA scan into the real world and people just do it, you know, willy-nilly. When it's in the, the research mode, like it is here in a clinical study, the DEXA scan is a, a very good way of measuring body composition. So um, that's actually something that I think is an interesting point of this. They didn't just do skin full calibers or anything like that. They used a very uh, technical and accurate means of determining body composition. But again, we're going to have to wait and see what more studies show. But um, this was interesting to me, and it does appear to show that exercise may not be enough in some cases to reduce the loss of muscle when people go on a low-carb diet. Again, we'll see what future studies learn. That was the first tip of maybe what not might, might not be a great diet. A second tip uh, of, of maybe a bad diet would be your hair starts falling out. Um, I have met people who have told me they start a weight loss program, 
and they're all gung-ho about it. And within a month or so, they begin to notice their hair falling out. So what the heck might be going on here? Well, it's possible. It's hard to tell, obviously. Uh, and, and just, but we speak in general. Any nutrition program that cuts out large groups of foods theoretically can lead to nutrient deficiencies. And we know that there's a variety of different vitamins and minerals, etc., which do play a role in hair maintenance and hair growth. For instance, uh, a lack of protein iron, zinc, vitamin D, niacin, and even the omega-3 fatty acids uh, and the omega-6 fatty acids can play a role in hair maintenance, uh, hair health. And if you're not getting enough of these nutrients, in some people, they could notice that their hair might start falling out. You get off the diet, hopefully the hair loss would start to, would stop and you maybe you start growing your hair normally again. That's great. Um, if it doesn't, then it may be time to go and see an endocrinologist because hair loss is obviously complicated. We still haven't figured out why that is. Um, so I think, you know, for instance, you know, hypothyroidism is a very common cause of hair loss in people, but that's not the only thing. So if, if it could be that the diet and the hair loss problem could coincide with each other and and if that is the case, then um, then maybe getting off the diet doesn't doesn't fix a problem. But generally, if you get off the diet and your hair starts stops falling out like it was before, then obviously it, may, it was probably the diet. Uh, speaking of uh, hair losses and stuff like that, there are a lot of supplements out there. Uh, just sidebar for a minute, a lot of supplements would do say that they will regrow your hair and stop hair loss. I have reviewed a lot of hair loss, hair regrowth supplements on supplementclarity.com, looked at the research and some of these things, broken them down by their ingredients. So if you're thinking about taking a hair growth supplement, do take a look at supplementclarity.com. You can you know skip on over to there's a search box and you can search for hair loss or hair growth and you can find these products and you can see what I've had to say about them. So check that out for more information. Okay, so that's number two, your hair falling out, obviously not a good sign. Number three on my list is you start getting cranky and angry and short-tempered around people. If after you start an eating program, people start commenting that you're biting their heads off and you're very cranky and again, short tempered, this might be a sign that you're not eating enough carbohydrates. What we have to remember is that the brain is one of the biggest organs in the body that consumes carbohydrate sugars. And when we're not getting enough sugar, our blood sugar drops. And this, in some cases, can result in people just getting, again, short-tempered around people. They're, maybe they don't think so well, a little fogginess in their thinking. Uh, they may, again, get angry at people, etc. Some people refer to this constellation of symptoms of tiredness and crankiness and angry. Sometimes they refer to this as the keto flu because it does sometimes pop up in people who do the keto diet. It usually materializes about you know a week or two weeks or so into the diet. The keto flu technically isn't a flu like a you know if you're infected with a cold or flu virus. It's just simply a term that is used to refer to that constellation of different symptoms that we're talking about here. I, I actually looked into keto flu before I went uh, live with this episode. And, uh, and interestingly enough, I couldn't find one clinical study which investigated the keto flu. So what we call the keto flu is this you know, general uh, a name that we give, and it actually hasn't been formally investigated by researchers as of yet. Eventually, that's probably going to change, and somebody will get around to taking it into the lab and testing it. Uh, what causes this constellation of symptoms? Again, I'm attributing it to to a lack of blood sugar to the brain, but it's quite possible there are other things involved as well. When we do change, for instance, our, our nutrition intake, we're eating different foods or not eating certain foods, for instance, we know this will alter the microbiome inside of us, that gut microbiome that people like to talk about these days. Those are the bacteria that live inside us, usually in our large intestine. Uh, we have about three pounds overall of bacteria living inside of us. There's 
there's bacteria everywhere. There's bacteria on us uh, as well as inside of us. And collectively, they're the microbiome. But we usually refer to them as the gut microbiome. And again, changing our dietary habits could alter our microbiome. And these microbiome do give off chemicals, which we can use to stay healthy. Is it possible that the keto flu may be influenced by changes in the gut microbiome? It's possible. We just don't really know yet. But again, if you go on a, on a weight loss program and suddenly people are commenting on how you're getting angry and short-tempered, um, whether or not it's the keto flu, it's, you know, I, I was just a sidebar on my part, but just realize that this may be due to a lack of carbohydrates in the diet, and that could be uh, the reason that you're feeling the way you're feeling. Okay, so if we leave number three, let's jump over right over to symptom number four of not such a great diet, and that is you can't poop anymore, or you're not pooping as much as you used to poop before. So what what's going on here? The idea is when you change your dietary habits, um, again, you are altering as well your microbiome, and they do play a role in our gut health and our, and our uh, bathroom health as well, if you will. But the thing to realize is that when you are not eating certain foods, um, this can play a role in bathroom health. And one of the things that plays a role the most is fiber. Fiber is something that not only makes us go to the bathroom, but it is also a food for those bacteria. You've probably uh, heard about the things called prebiotics. And prebiotics, you may be taking supplements that can name prebiotics. Uh, a prebiotic is the food of the probiotic bacteria. Okay. And when and when you think about what's called what a prebiotic is, just realize it's really fiber. Fiber and prebiotic is the same thing, essentially. Uh, fiber is not a very sexy name. Prebiotic is. So when you're not getting enough fiber in your diet, you're not getting enough of those prebiotics. This can alter the microbiome, and that may not be so good for us in some cases. But getting back to the uh, the, the poop aspect, going to the bathroom aspect of things, again, lack of fiber means you're, you have to strain when you go to the bathroom. You may not be going to the bathroom as much, and that's not such a good thing. And also, again, if we come back to the microbiome, we know that we live in concert with these bacteria inside of us. They eat the food that we eat, like fiber, and they in turn give off chemicals that we can use to stay healthy. For instance, some of you may have heard of things called short chain fatty acids. Um, these are fatty acids that are not—they're not long chain fats, or not—they're not medium chain fats. They're short chain fatty acids. And our bodies can use some of these things to help our immune system. There's, e For instance, there's even some evidence that these short chain fatty acids given off by our probiotic bacteria may even help reduce our risk of colon cancer. So again, fiber is very important for our ability to go to the bathroom. Yes, and if you do omit fiber, that can be a problem. But long term, what does the lack of fiber in the diet do to our long term health? I'm not sure yet. There, there is evidence that people who don't get enough fiber do tend to have more colon cancer. And could that be due to the lack of short chain fatty acids or alterations in our microbiome? Again, more research is needed, but uh, beyond the whole, you know, having trouble going to the bathroom thing, um, just make sure you're getting enough fiber in your diet. And it, honestly, it doesn't take a lot of fiber to get the recommended daily allowance. Uh, sidebar here, the recommended daily, daily allowance for fiber is about an ounce a day. That's not much. Uh, most people, it's recommended they get between about 14 and about 28 or 30 grams of fiber a day. That's it. Um, and again, there's 28 grams in an ounce. So most people should aim for about an ounce of fiber a day. In America, most people get about 12 to 14 grams if they're lucky. So again, why? People are usually not eating the foods that have fiber, fruits and veggies and beans and seeds. So if you add a few more of those things to your diet, you're getting more fiber, your microbiome is happier, and you'll go to the bathroom more. All right, so so much for pooping. <laughs> Let's jump over to number five in my list of uh, not so fun things about certain diets. And that is, number five is rapid weight loss. If the diet claims you're going to lose weight really fast, or if you do lose weight really fast uh, when you go on a weight loss program, that may not be such a great thing, especially for your long-term health. What am I talking about here? Well, when we lose weight very quickly, like you're losing, for instance, you know, 10 pounds, 20 pounds in a month, okay, this is eventually going to slow down your metabolic rate, your metabolism. 
What is metabolism? Metabolism is essentially the speed at which we burn calories. So as metabolisms drop, that means we're not going to burn as many calories. The body essentially circles the wagon saying, hey, what's going on? I'm not eating enough calories to stay healthy. And so your body literally takes its foot off the accelerator. And just like when you do with your car, your car slows down. When we take our foots off the metabolism accelerator, our metabolism slow down. And this actually may be a bigger thing than most people realize. A study came out a few years ago on uh, the former contestants of the popular TV show, The Biggest Loser. You've probably all seen this show. You take a bunch of people and they, they would, they take them to the ranch and personal trainers would work with them. And basically these people were put on a, on a fairly low calorie diet, lower than they were, they were normally eating. Usually, you know, between 16 and 1800 calories a day and they were exercising, you know, goodness knows how long. I've heard reports of, you know, eight to 10 hours a day of exercise, but I can't confirm that. Regardless, if you watch the TV show, you saw people sometimes drop in 20 pounds a week, 25 pounds a week, 30 pounds a week. And people over the course of the show dropped tremendous amounts of weight. Well, these researchers came out and they said, what did all that really tremendous and fast weight loss do to their metabolism? And so they looked at former contestants of The Biggest Loser and they did some metabolic tests on them to find out what their metabolic rate was. And they found that these former contestants actually had metabolisms that burned about 500 fewer calories per day. In other words, they burned 500 fewer calories a day than people who were never on the TV show. Their metabolism had had dropped by about 500 calories a day. That means that all things being equal, they would have to work 500 calories a day harder than non-contestants to achieve now the same weight loss results. That's a problem because this study came out several years after The Biggest Loser and, and this noted, they noted that this uh, drop in metabolism appeared to have persisted for at least six years after they were on the TV show. So the dropping of the metabolic rate appeared to last a long time. We don't know how long it might last. Uh, we do know, um, and, I'm, and I'm sure that a lot of you are aware of this, um, a lot of those former contestants on that TV show did regain practically all the weight that they had lost when they were on the TV show. And, and that's fairly true for most people who go on uh, really dramatic diets and weight loss programs like that. They tend to regain all, if not more, of the weight they had lost. So that that's a problem as well. And could that regaining of the weight be due to the reduction in their in their metabolic rate? I think that's possible, but I also think it's, you know, the thing to realize when you go on some of these TV shows, you, they cloister you away. You can't eat what you normally eat. They force you into a very regimented uh, system of exercise and eating. That's not what happens in the real world. So it makes sense when you stop doing that very regimented, very intense weight loss program that the weight tends to come back. So if you're picking a uh, diet or weight loss program, the thing to remember is this, a couple of rules of thought that I usually tell people when, I, when, I, when they say to me, hey, I'm trying to lose weight. Remember the rule of thumb when it comes to weight loss. When, when you lose weight fast, most of the weight in the beginning is water. And the reason for that is when you cut back on your calories or your carbohydrates, your body taps into the carbohydrates that are stored inside your muscles. And those carbohydrates are called glycogen. Glycogen is just essentially a storage form of carbohydrates in our muscle. Well, with that glycogen is a lot of water. So the rule of thumb when it comes to glycogen is this. Every one gram of glycogen has about two to three grams of water frozen up with it. So take things to extreme. If you lose a pound of glycogen, you've lost maybe two to three pounds of water. And so when people go on a weight loss program and they lose weight really fast, they get on a scale a week later and then they say, well, I'm down five pounds. Most of that weight they lost is water. And it's when the weight loss slows down that people tend to get discouraged and they stop the diet. But hold your horses, that's what you want. When the weight loss slows down, that's when you're losing mostly fat. So remember, when you lose weight really fast, it's mostly water. When the weight loss slows down, that's when you're tapping into your body fat reserves. And, and so I think that's, a, that's something people need to keep in the back of their mind because again, when the weight loss does slow down, that's when people say, ah, it's not working no more and they stop it. 
It's the slow weight loss that you want. And in terms of long-term weight loss, what do you should be looking at per week? Um, again, just rule of thumb, anywhere from a half a pound to no more than two pounds per week, you're in the sweet spot. Again, in the beginning of, of, of some weight loss programs, you may lose more than that. And again, that's mostly going to be water. But if you're if you eventually slow down to about a half a pound to two pounds a week, you're again, you're in the zone, you're in the sweet spot. Okay, so number six. Now we're up to, boy, we're going fast with this time. Number six in, in our list of uh, not so healthy diet attributes. This one is if you go on an eating program and you know soon afterwards you notice that you're getting cold all the time, um, that's probably the fact, again, your metabolism is dropping. And again, metabolism plays a role in, in heat production. If you're not, your metabolism is dropping, you may start feeling cold. Another thought is that your reduction in calories may also be reducing your production of thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is the hormone which regulates your metabolic rate. And there is some evidence that reduction in calories, drastic reduction in calories, can reduce thyroid hormone levels by as much as over 60%. Um, so again, we call the, and again, the, the, these really low calorie diets um, are called, you technically VL. LCD, very low calorie diets. And they're not the typical diet that I think most people are going to be doing. They usually are, you know, well under a thousand calories. Um, one study looked at the over, over 400 calorie a day diet reduced uh, thyroid hormone levels. Again, most people are not going to be doing this, but these diets are out there and they've been popular for quite a long time. So if you do go perusing the internet, you may find some of these very low cal calorie diets out there. You know, one that's been around for business Zillions of years, for instance, would be like the cabbage soup diet. You know, you just eat cabbage soup and you lose a lot of weight. Yeah, there's not a lot of calories in cabbage soup. You know, um, there are even, for instance, some, and this is very popular these days, there are even some fasting diets which have, like, for instance, 500 calories a day. Um, that's crazy, in my opinion. Uh, you need more than 500 calories a day to sustain your sustain your body and stay healthy. But you know, when I looked on the internet, I did see some 500 calorie a day fasting and intermittent fasting programs out there. I would say stay as far away from those as you can. I don't think they're healthy. And then another diet, for instance, which is very low calorie, which has been around for gee whiz decades, is something called the uh, HCG diet. This is a diet where you eat 500 calories a day and you take a supplement of a pregnancy hormone called HCG, HCG being human core chorionic gonadotropin, human chorionic gonadotropin. The idea is that if you take this hormone, whether via injection by a doctor or through a homeopathic liquid that you put on your tongue, that the HGC hormone will uh, help you uh, burn fat and preserve your muscle tissue. I've looked into that particular diet um, on supplementclarity.com. If you go there, you, you can see my reviews of, of the HCG diet diet. Um, I have a lot to say about it, but regardless, I don't think uh, four and 500 calorie a day diets are appropriate for most people. And so um, I would stay clear of them for a number of reasons, not just for the fact that they may reduce your thyroid hormone levels, but because I just don't think they're healthy overall. And then wrapping up my top seven tips of not such a great diet is you're tired all the time. In fact, you're too tired to exercise. Um, exercise is extremely important uh, for weight loss. And if you're not eating enough calories to give yourself the energy to exercise, I really do think long-term that's not a great idea for you to be doing um, because generally speaking, it may result in some muscle loss. Now, it's pretty well established that most weight loss programs result may result in some type of muscle loss. And that may even be true for high protein diets as well. As we cut back our calories, our, again, our body looks for an alternative energy source and it'll start eventually breaking down amino acids, uh, turning them into sugar. And again, as we said in point number one, in some cases, this could even result in people smelling like ammonia. 
So how much weight loss on some of these low calorie diets, low carb diets could be coming from muscle? Well, there is some evidence that in some studies have shown between 20 and 35% of weight loss um, could be coming from muscle loss. Okay. And that's again, in people who just go on diets and do not exercise at the same time. When people exercise while they're on a diet, the contribution of muscle loss is much less. So in other words, you hold on to more of your muscle. And and you may be wondering what's the best type of exercise to maintain your muscle while you're exercising. Both aerobic exercise and even resistance training has been shown to preserve muscle during weight loss programs. So it's not just strength training. Yes, that is important, but even things like do you know riding a bike and jogging, etc., and taking group exercise classes. These also can help preserve muscle during weight loss. So the big issue with all this is the realization that if you say you go on a weight loss program and you do not exercise, yeah, you lose some muscle. The thing to realize is that those muscle fibers don't come back. There's no evidence, for instance, that humans can grow new muscle fibers. Um, now, yeah, we do have billions and billions of muscle fibers, uh, but you want to hold on to as much of them as you possibly can. Some of you may know that I like to talk about a condition that happens as we get older called sarcopenia. Sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is essentially muscle loss um, as we get older. It's muscle loss that happens during the aging process. Um, and again, sarcopenia is, is a problem because as we lose muscle, we tend to get weaker. As we get weaker, we tend to do less things. And as we do less things, we don't exercise as much. Well, exercise is very well known to reduce the risk of pretty much all medical problems, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, you name it. So as we do less because we're weaker, um, this in theory might open up the, door the doorway to other bad things happening to us, which may uh, again, take us under. So again, this, this drastic weight loss may accelerate muscle loss, which again, over the course of decades may compound with other things that may happen to us. And the result, you know, decades down the road is, you know, you, you may no longer be able to get off the toilet or get out of a chair, or get off the floor. And when that happens, when that person is no longer strong enough to take care of themselves anymore, well, then unfortunately they may not be in their home much longer and they may wind up in a nursing home. And I can tell you that a nursing home is not the greatest place to be. Some of you know that my grandmother lived to 104 years old. I spent about the last three years of her life uh, trying to help her while she was in a nursing home. And it, I can tell you uh, close up, they're not fun places to be. A lot of people I think are in nursing homes because they are no longer strong enough to take care of themselves anymore, not because they have dementia. I think it's because they um, have stopped exercising over the years and slowly the aging process has caught up to them. And one day they just, they realize they can no longer get out of a chair and, or off the toilet, and now they're in trouble. Um, again, I'm, I'm drifting off the topic here, but I, I want to give you a glimpse into the way I, I view this loss of muscle, not only with dieting, um, but also through the aging process. Um, generally, muscle does not have to be destroyed as we get older. Sarcopenia, as I mentioned, does not have to occur. Sarcopenia mostly occurs because people stop exercising. So if we continue exercising, uh, we hold hold on to more of our muscle, and this can help people stay healthy throughout the lifespan or health span, as many people say. And in turn, this can keep people out of a nursing home, which I think is the greatest gift you can give to another human being. Keep them strong so they can stay in their home. So I drifted off topic a little bit on this, but I, you know, I, I usually do when I think about this loss of muscle and its implications for our long-term uh, health and viability as we get older, because I do think it's a it's an issue that I don't hear anybody talking about. And, and again, so, you know, you know, coming back to uh, my main topic for this today is, you know, wait, you know, if you're too tired to exercise, that's not a good sign of a diet. And whether it's a low calorie diet, low carb diet, whatever diet you choose, gang, I need you to be able to exercise while you are eating fewer calories. That's going to help you hold on to more of your muscle as you lose weight. And long term, that's going to help you stay healthier throughout your lifespan. Remember, Slow and steady weight loss wins the race in more than one way.
If you know of any other tips or reasons why some diets may not be so healthy, feel free to reach out to me at either my websites, joe-canna.com or supplementclarity.com, um, and I'll be glad to read your email and respond to you. I will post the summary of this episode with all the citations I used at uh, the link at joe-canna.com, so you want to check them out if, uh, if you want more information. And that is about all I have for this episode, except for I will leave you with the quote of the week. And the quote of the week goes like this, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. And Frank, so true. Until next time, gang, I'm Joe Cannon. Go out and make a difference.